we had a spontaneous night last night. And um, we had an uh, Indian brother come in, and he was in the area. And I hadn't connected with him. I'd never met him. And uh, so we had him come to Thursday night. And just want to share what happened that Thursday night. Uh, we have our weekly staff meetings um, on Thursday at 10 o'clock. And so we met together. We had a, a staff meeting. We talked about what we need to talk about. We prayed about what we need to pray about. We were just about ready to go. And um, Stephanie Steele, who heads up our prophetic intercessors team here, um, she just had a burden of the Lord. And she said, I just am about to burst at the seams. I need to share this. And uh, so we shifted gears, and, and we, instead of closing, we got together uh, in a circle. She shared her prophetic burden, and we prayed into it. And that prophetic burden was uh, from a passage of Scripture that goes back into uh, the Old Testament. It's uh, re recorded in the Chronicles, and it's where David is surrounded by his enemies, and it's a desperate time, and He's praying to the Lord what to do. And the Lord says, go out against your enemies and, uh, and I'll, uh, I, I'll subdue them before you and I will overwhelm them as floodwaters that are bursting through a broken dam. And uh, that was a disclosure of one of the names of God, uh, the... The concurrent uh, at the time, the the uh, in the land of the Philistines, the word Lord was Baal, and so um, he was uh, taken on the Philistines over contested land. And so, um, in Scripture, he says that that God revealed Himself as Baal Perizim, or uh, we would interpret that as the master of breakthroughs. And so, um, so we uh, prayed into that, and the sense was that God was about to uh, do something uh, very, very significant and something that manifest his power, and that it would happen um, aggressively and suddenly like the bursting of a dam. Now, um, when the Orville Dam was, uh, be, was threatened uh, with breaking, um, a few years ago, they said that uh, within a couple of hours, the floodwaters would hit San Francisco. And that's really something to think about um, uh, in, in terms of something happening very quickly and in a profound and powerful way. And so, um, you know, we here, uh, we've thought a little bit about floodwaters bursting through a dam because it would uh, bury Yuba City and Marysville in a couple of minutes. Uh, but anyway, in a spiritual analogy, we were excited about that. And then uh, Thursday for our EHOP, our uh, Embassy House of Prayer, uh, we had Samuel Kumar. Again, he's from India, a uh, uh, man of God. He connected with us actually through Isaac Mate, because Isaac Mate, which uh, for years was a part of our pastoral leadership team and a great friend from Romania, but Isaac Mate and Samuel Kumar um, knew one another at Regent University where they both went to school. So that's how the connection came. And um, so he, he came, and, and uh, I knew he was a good man, loved the Lord. What I didn't know is that God had really given him a prophetic unction that had everything to do with the, the same uh, burden that came over Stephanie. And so he talked about seed time and harvest, and he talked about God doing a quick work. And, and he talked about uh, this same passage of scripture that she had been so burdened with just a few hours before in the staff meeting. And so um, as I was just sensing that, that God was really speaking, remember the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established uh, as true. And so uh, we, we had had such a really, uh, such a, profound and clear uh, demonstration of what the burden of the Lord was about God doing something divine and powerful and, and quickly. And, um, 
And as I looked around the room, I was, uh, I was a little surprised, really, to see in uh, that Thursday night prayer meeting uh, all of the couples that, um, what was it, 17 years ago, something like that? Uh, it was 2008? Okay. So I have however many uh, years ago uh, that was, seven years ago, whatever. Uh, we had been praying into what we felt like God was doing in this area. And there had been some prophetic words about God uh, establishing um, a region that he would pour out his, his glory over and that it would be a hundred mile radius from here in every direction would be a, a hub uh, that would become a center of God's glory and that people would come from the nations of the world to be here and they would be uh, saved and healed and delivered and the glory of God would be the key feature. Well, of course, as you know, uh, just recently we, we did... Uh, show us your glory conference and we've been talking a lot about the fulfillment of these prophetic words and honestly they, the momentum is really picking up but as I sat there and listened to this uh, man of God just share what the Lord had burdened him with of course he, he didn't know anything about our history I looked around I thought wow uh, Cheryl and I were there uh, Bob Beer and Katrina were there uh, I looked uh, across the room and there was um, Louise and Rosie, Mercedes, I'm going to remember Louise and Rosie, yeah, and they were there, and uh, Tim and Kim Kurtz were there, and of course, Tim and Kim, we, we've got a lot of history with them, and uh, for years, they used our campus for their church services, but we were all there, and I thought, wow, this is, this is uh, very prophetic. Now, with this picture that you see behind me here, when God spoke that to us, we took it very seriously. We were praying into it. Um, I felt very strongly that God had uh, commissioned us and ordained that we would drive that perimeter uh, and, and take stakes. Uh, I, I, would, I think I said there were 100 of them, but, but as I think back, there, there were 72 of them. Uh, because we got them in, in bundles of uh, a dozen. But anyway, we, we took steaks and we soaked them in a mixture of uh, wine and water and oil. And, um, and we took those steaks to key places and, and we, we did a, a four-day tour. It, it was quite a tour. And uh, we drove to the perimeter and then we drove a, as best we could we drove all the way around that, and at key places, we would stop and we would drive those stakes in the ground as memorials to this, uh, this um, to our acceptance of the promises of God for this region. And we, we stopped all over. We went to uh, Berkeley campus. We went to all kind of places where... Um, you know, Indian uh, raids were done, Indian massacres back in the gold rush days. We went all around to different places and we drove those stakes in the ground. And uh, in each one of those places, uh, we drove the stake clear down un under the ground and covered it over so uh, it, it will be there forever and ever, amen. Uh, and we prayed in those places and we prayed into this promise that God would pour out his glory in Northern California, that he would destroy all the work of the devil. That's what Jesus came to do, not some of the work of the devil, to destroy all the work of the devil. That this place would be characterized as his glory. And, and of course, gold in scripture represents glory. And, and this area uh, is, uh, uh, I've heard it's the richest gold uh, area in the world. The, the Yuba River, I, I read an article about it being the richest gold river in world history, and that, that's really amazing for little Yuba Duba Doo. But, but anyway, uh, we had years ago, we had John Dawson come. Uh, I had known him um, from, you know, just ministry contacts, and I had gone down and 
done a DTS, uh, that stands for Discipleship Training School, at his Youth with a Mission base in Los Angeles and got to know him. And I asked him to come up and just uh, minister to us. And he said, I respect him for saying this. He said, I'll come up and minister to you if you will fly me up a couple of days early and just let me roam around and pray and, and sense uh, God's heart for the region. And I really respected that. We flew him up and he, he did prayer walks through Yuba City and Marysville. And um, it's really interesting. Um, he, he said, I, God showed me the, the spirit of this region. He said, it's, it's actually the spirit of Marysville, which, of course, was established before Yuba City. And he said, it's the spirit of an, uh, a badly abused young girl. Uh, and and I, I saw it, and I tried to interact with it, and this, this, uh, this spirit that took the form of an abused child wouldn't look up at him and was covered with shame. And, um, and so he came that night, and he, he prophesied that God was going to heal the region and heal the land. And uh, just like a badly abused uh, young child that is filled with self-loathing and, and uh, self-hatred, a uh, broken self-esteem won't look you in the eye, but that God was going to redeem things here and that a young lady would become a, a princess of God and um, she would take her rightful place and fulfill her destiny and um, uh, be beautiful and radiate the glory of God. He came and he shared that and then he went on to... Uh, share what we call uh, one of the mother load prophecies because we've had a number of them uh, and we'll talk more about that first chance we get. But he, he said, the mother load of the California gold fields has not yet been found, but it will be found in the future. And the issue is not uh, worldly wealth, which is a lot of times associated with gold, but gold represents glory, which is why all the articles of the holy place and the most holy place were, were pure gold. It represents the glory of God. And he said, in God's creative purposes, looking toward the end of the age, God put um, um, a massive amount of gold into the land here uh, to represent this as a region that would be characterized by the glory of God. And uh, this, again, goes back several years. For, for many years, uh, over 20 years, we've prayed into these, these uh, promises. And, um, and so Thursday night, here was this man who had never uh, visited Yuba City before. He comes from uh, southern India, and he, he was really um, affirming the same things, prophesying the same things that we had heard so many years ago. But in his context, uh, where uh, initially it was someday God will, um, our brother Samuel Kumar was saying the time for the harvest has come. It's time for those prophecies to be fulfilled. Now, all this is on the heels of uh, without going uh, into too much detail, but there's a uh, there's a gold mine. It's just north of here that was the richest gold mine in uh, the California gold rush days, and uh, we're uh, we're friends of the people that hold the uh, the family claim to that and have for uh, for all these years uh, for three generations. But in any event. Uh, we're just, we just prayed with them uh, earlier that day about uh, reopening that gold mine, and uh, there's a lot of exciting things there. But th this is the point that I want to make. Uh, the gold is simply a representation of the eternal purposes of God to manifest his glory here. And if you know anything about the California gold rush, it uh, was just replete with all kinds of abuses. There was uh, murder and, and, uh, and whoredom and 
uh, slavery and all kinds of things that uh, were brought about by human greed and avarice. But the, the, the thing that's about to happen will be pure and holy and a blessing to the world both naturally and even more significantly spiritually, a manifestation of the glory of, of God. Now, we've been, uh, we've been talking about this, praying into it for 20 years, but uh, the uh, Noahic covenant is a promise of God that as long as the earth remains, the principle of seed time and harvest will always be honored by God. It's right there in the Noahic covenant. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time followed by harvest. That's the principle. Now, we have uh, prayed for many, many, many years into God pouring out his glory in this area. And so the really exciting thing that happened uh, just uh, these last couple of days is a prophetic word of God that's coming to us. Of course, Lori, uh, God gave her uh, the prophetic burden that she shared. Uh, there are many others that uh, are, are feeling that way. Paul, Keith, and Amy were just here. They, they want to come back again. They sense what God's doing. And that it's a, a now time. It's a time uh, of harvest. And, you know, you don't get a harvest without taking good care of the seed. You've got you to gotta believe in it. You've got to cultivate the ground. You've got to plant the seed. You've got to take care of the seed. You've got to water the seed. But if you will do that, you will reap a harvest. And I think we're right on the cusp of harvest. Now, uh, we went around um, in 2008. Uh, we did, I think it was a four-day trip. Uh, we'd, we'd drive, we'd pray, we'd drive, we'd pray. We essentially prayed for four days without chit-chatting. I mean, we just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And um, we, we just had a, a great time. Um, and, and we sealed the perimeter. Then later, we went by airplane and um, we, we flew that perimeter. And how many know that we're being poisoned from the air these days? All kinds of bad things. Well, guess what? This region got blessed from the air while, while they didn't even know what was going on. And we, we got big tubs of wine, water, and oil. Those are covenant elements. And, and we flew the entire perimeter and, and we, we anointed everything with oil. Is that cool? I thought that was cool. I, it was fun. And, um, you know, and we prayed the whole time, God, let your anointing come, break the bondages of hell, open the heavens, destroy uh, all the work of the enemy. Uh, and we, we really had a great time uh, praying around uh, the 100-mile radius. And uh, so, so then last night, uh, as we invited Samuel Kumar to come and to share what uh, God had put on his heart in terms of being harvest time for all the prayers that had been sown. Uh, he uh, had been talking to um, Katrina and Bulbeer. They had talked about something that we did in 1999. And we went up and we, uh, we took a proclamation to the high point of this region, which is called Altar Rock. And it's, it's uh, just right out here behind the church. Um, and uh, it's been a high place for many, 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 many generations. It's where the Maidu Indians, uh, they said it was a sacred place. And, and, uh, but before that, um, it's just always been uh, a place that is a spiritual portal. At the base of Alta Rock, uh, there's a place called the Witch's uh, Graveyard. And uh, for years, Yuba City had... Um, had a unit that investigated occult crimes. They got to be so commonplace that they, they don't even have the unit anymore. But uh, John, the guy that headed that up, uh, was a friend of mine, and uh, we talked a lot uh, for a number of years there about uh, the occult crime that was happening in the area. And he used to call me and just say, we, we just happen to know there's going to be a a ritual at Witch's Graveyard. We can't do anything about it. It's private property. Uh, we, can't, um, <clears throat> we can't 
get a warrant to do anything about it, but um, there's no doubt going to be a human sacrifice out there on this date, usually a solstice or something like that. And so he would call, his name was John Summers, he would call and say, you people do uh, what, you, what you know how to do. He said, it's out of our hands, but there's something bad going down there. And so we've had uh, ongoing experiences. But anyway, that led to me uh, feeling prompted of God. Uh, we were, we've been doing men's prayer on Friday mornings for over 30 years. And uh, so uh, we, we called it SWAT team at the time, Spiritual Weapons and Tactics. And um, I chose six other guys. I wanted a team of seven to actually go up onto Altar Rock. It's private property, and it's controlled by um, a generational uh, occult families. And so you you can't get up there. It's it's private property. However, we did. We just uh, left at O-Dark 30. And we marched up there. We marched up there with a proclamation that was here. I don't know where it went, but hopefully it's still here. It's not. Okay, so um, let's see. I, I might be able, Paul, can you see if that's on my desk? Yeah. But anyway, um, I was really praying into it. I was doing prayer drives uh, several times a week around the buttes, uh, around Altar Rock. Altar Rock is so significant. It's, it's the midpoint on a ley line between Mount Shasta, where there's a lot of occult activity, uh, and Mount Diablo, where there's a lot of occult activity. And so uh, we, we were privy to the fact that uh, warlocks came from as far away as Mexico City to uh, offer blood sacrifices on the buttes on Resurrection Weekend. And they had done that for a long time. They'd come up. They, they told the newscasters and whatnot that they, uh, that they offered a, a goat uh, to uh, the guardian of the buttes. But, but anyway, uh, we're, we're finding out more and more that, uh, that at the high levels of occult activity, whatever they tell you they're going to sacrifice, it's usually a human child. And so anyway, um, so we knew there was a great deal of evil going on up there. And after uh, praying for a long time in my prayer drives, um, I wrote out a proclamation uh, that Paul's looking for. I I hope he'll be able to find it. But it was a proclamation that I put uh, on paper and then I sealed it in plastic. And um, the we... I I chose six guys. We actually had a helicopter plan to let us down on the very top of Alter Rock uh, before daylight that morning. But uh, the the night before the helicopter pilot chickened out, he said, if I get caught, I'll lose my license and blah, blah, blah. And what if somebody falls down the rope and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, so bless his heart and all that jazz. But um, I just called the guys and said, um, it's going to be a lot harder than we thought. If you're out, I understand that. But if you're in, meet me at 3.30 in the morning, and we're going to go up there, and we're going to hike up to the top of Alter Rock. Uh, we'll climb by cable up to the very top of the altar, and, and uh, I'm going to do this with or without you all. All six of them came, so a team of seven headed up there, uh, and we... We hiked up there. We uh, made it all the way up to the top of the rock. I think we have uh, some pictures. Do, do you have pictures of us up on Alter Rock there? Uh, you didn't? You sure about that? That would be me in my skinny, younger form, <laughs> blowing a shofar on top of Alter Rock. But anyway, uh, while they're looking for that, uh, we went up there and we just made a proclamation of the triumph of Christ over this region. And um, we, we took communion together. Uh, we poured out 
uh, wine, water, and oil. Uh, and th those are uh, emblems of the covenant. And uh, I got right up on the very, very top of the, thank you, Paul, uh, very top of, yeah, they couldn't find those pictures up there. I don't know if you got, but anyway, this is, this is skinny me. I know, you know, I posted this on True Social uh, last night. They said, who's that? <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> anyway, this, <laughs> this is my mini me. <laughs> this is my maxi me. But anyway... Uh, I, I have a picture of this that uh, sits on my desk in my office to remind me of this, this covenant. And we made a proclamation uh, in the hearing of us as witnesses of the earth, but also uh, the denizens of uh, the kingdom of darkness and all the hosts of heaven. And I want to read it to you. Uh, Remember, this is what we, we sealed uh, and dropped into a crevice in the heart of the rock. And um, it says, as representatives of the kingdom of God, we hereby declare that all the territories which these Sutter Buttes overlook, so far as the eye can see, let me just pause and say, when you were standing on the tip top of Alter Rock, you would be shocked how far the eye can see. It's really something. Um, the, the, the uh, Maidu Indians called the, uh, the land of Histinumi or something like that, but it meant the land between the lands. And um, that was between the Pacific Coastal Range and the uh, Sierra Nevadas. That, that, that's the only high point in the middle of this valley. But you can see for a long way in every direction from there. And so, again... As representatives of the kingdom of God, we hereby declare that all the territories which these Sutter Buttes overlook, so far as the eye can see, are hereby subjugated to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the indisputable King of kings and Lord of lords. We proclaim the triumph of the Spirit of the Lord over all principalities and powers, governments, thrones, dominions, and spirits of wickedness in the heavens, upon the earth, and in the regions under the earth. We hereby exercise our dominion over all the power of the devil by declaring the defeat of every spirit of death, sickness, and disease by the spirit of life, the defeat of every spirit of hatred, unforgiveness, and fear by the spirit of love, the defeat of every spirit of bondage, addiction, and oppression by the spirit of liberty, and the defeat of every spirit of deception, perversion, and spiritual darkness by the spirit of light. We claim all these lands and their inhabitants for the kingdom of God and forbid any evil spirits to occupy any place or to operate in any way in these counties. By the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his shed blood, by the power of his eternal word and his Holy Spirit, we proclaim these things in his name. Amen. That's July 3rd, 1999. And then um, we... Uh, we blew the shofars and we dropped that covenant into the ground and had us a little praise fest. That's us up there blowing the shofars. That's awesome. That's, uh, that's me if you don't recognize me. That's big dog, Dwayne. Uh, Jim Carpenter, who now pastors uh, another church in Marysville, was there. Our good friend Eric Kruger, who also was the pilot that flew us uh, all around uh, that 100-mile uh, um, radius, the perimeter there. Uh, Dave Sims, uh, next to him, uh, the fellow that you don't recognize there is uh, Jess Parker. <laughs> And uh, then my oldest son, James, we, we all went up there. And, um, you know, I do a lot of teaching on spiritual warfare. Um, it's very well received in, in third world countries. In the West, the people that drag their feet on it are uh, pastors and spiritual leaders who don't know the, the first thing about spiritual warfare. 
So I'm always hearing somebody say, oh, I, don't, I don't believe in that, and you know, I don't believe in territorial spirits, and ab -de -ab -de -ab -de -ab -de -ab. let me tell you what happened. Uh, we, we did that. We had a great time up there, and uh, we worshiped, and we made a proclamation. It is our right to do so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are supposed to be the proclaimers of truth as it is in Jesus. And sadly, uh, the church in the West has listened to the, the proclamation, the prognostication of evil people and, um, and has just uh, very often submitted to that. But we were up there to proclaim the kingdom of God. Did you know the Bible still says the earth belongs to the Lord along with everything in it? That, that's as much Bible as John 3.16. And so we made a proclamation, and uh, we said we proclaim that we have dominion over these lands uh, for the establishment of the eternal kingdom of God. And we bless the people. The people of, of these regions have been cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed, but we were there to break the power of the curse and to bless the region and call it into its destiny. Remember, I, I was already holding in my heart the prophecy of um, of John that the that he saw the redemption of the spirit of this region that it would lose its shame that it would come into its destiny and that it would be a testimony to the glory of God and so uh, we proclaimed that we had a great time uh, we came down off there uh, and had a Fourth of July celebration and, and went uh, back to uh, life as usual which for us was. Uh, proclaiming the kingdom and praying for the sick and casting out demons and all the kind of things we do around here. Now, something very unique happened. That next week, when we were ministering deliverance to people, it happened to me several times, and then Jess Parker came down, knocked on the door, and said, you'll never believe what is happening. And uh, Of course, I already knew because it was happening to me, but this is what would happen. When we got to the point of casting a demon out, which there's usually a, a, a power confrontation and, and um, it, it's, not, um, it's not generally just a, a momentary thing. It's uh, figuring out where uh, a right was given for evil to do what it's doing and then confronting that and dealing with it. And then, but when we got to the point of casting the spirit out, those spirits, after we did that, those spirits would say, hey, uh, before you cast me out, I have a message from the guardian of the buttes. That is a, a, a dragon spirit named Bakai, the dark warrior. And... Um, and so anyway, it happened in Jess's office. It happened down the hole in my office. And the message was, if you will go up and stand where you stood when you made that declaration and uh, basically take it back, like, uh, you know, uh, unringing the bell on everything I said, if you will renounce that pronunciation, We'll give you wealth and fame and riches and all the, the uh, pleasures of this fallen world. I, I just thought to myself, all these years, and you haven't come up with a different plan. That's exactly what the devil said to Jesus. If you will just bow down and worship me, I'll, I'll give you uh, anything in this fallen realm. And, of course, we just said ridiculous. Uh, uh, you, you just tell him he's not the prince of this region anymore. Jesus Christ, is, he's been defeated. Now, um, I don't know how long, I don't know if you remember, Jess, but several weeks went by, and we heard that multiple times, and we, we told them, uh, quit already. Well, we are never going to do that. We are never going to take that back. That will stand in and uh, on into eternity. And, and so, uh, one day later, and it seems to me like it was like the third week after that, 
Same thing happened. The demon said, before you cast me out, I have a message from the guardian of the buttes. I said, I'm not even going to listen to it. No, no, no. New message. I said, really? He said, yeah. He says, the guardian of the butte says, because of your obstinance, because he gave you a chance to recant, and because of your pride, you wouldn't, we are going to offer blood sacrifices against you every day until you recant. And... And then the spirit did what uh, Lucifer did to Jesus Christ in the wilderness, began to quote scripture. He quoted the scripture about the watchman on the wall. And it's from Ezekiel. It says, if, if a watchman is on the wall and sees danger approaching and doesn't warn the people and do everything he can to, to stave it off, then the blood of the people are on his hands. And, and this spirit said... Everybody that dies, their blood is on your hands because you had a chance to go up on the mountain and to end this, and you chose not to. And so, of course, we, we rebuked the devil and uh, reminded them not to abuse the word of God, and we went on with our, uh, with our lives. And now, at the time... Uh, Jess and I, along with uh, Bill Jens and uh, Lou Benninger, and I'm not sure who else was on the team at that time, but anyway, uh, our pastoral leadership team, uh, we, we met as we did every week, and Lou Benninger heads up the trauma intervention program, and he's been on pastoral staff since the time Cheryl and I got here uh, 37 years ago, and he's our community liaison and he's just out there looking for opportunities uh, to, for, for this church to be salt and light and to meet urgent needs in the community. And by the way, does a great job. Uh, he's heading up uh, the Freedom Coalition at this point. There's information back there. And by the way, uh, there's a Sunday night coming up. We'll tell you more about it. But we're bringing Dr. Frank back. Uh, he was at the Bards Fest, and, and um, everybody uh, was anxious to have him come back. He's coming back for a Sunday night service right here. Uh, we'll give you details about that. But Lou's always busy doing that sort of stuff. So when we met for our pastoral meeting, Lou said, hey, uh, something's up. And remember, he started the trauma intervention program here. And so every time there's a 911 call in Yuba or Sutter County, every time, there's, that call goes to the emergency responders, including the trauma intervention program. And 24-7, we scramble somebody to go there and to, to be there as the, uh, a soft side uh, caregiver just to, to love people, to help people, and to have somebody that's there just for them. Because the fire department puts out the fire, the police department arrests the bad guy, the ambulance driver stops the bleeding. But we wanted somebody there just to love those people and to be there for them. So uh, we had been a part of um, those 911 calls for a long time. Now, Lou, in our uh, elders meeting, he said, something's up. He said, every day this week, there was... Uh, a fatal accident on the border of our property. And he started talking about what had happened, just bizarre things. People dress in black, throw themselves out in front of a truck. Uh, an Indian boy had a, a perfect uh, record at school, uh, went demonic, got a butcher knife and stabbed a neighbor to death and just weird things. But they were all around the perimeters of this 40 acres including a, a seven-person accident out on 99 on what would be the northwest corner of our property. And, and, uh, and somebody laid down in front of a, a, the train right over here uh, at the southeast corner of our property. So, so Lou, um, while Jess and I were casting out demons, Lou was going to bizarre crises that were all around our property. 
And so he brought it up. And I said, well, I know exactly what that's all about. So we told him uh, what had, we had, the, the encounter that we had had. And so we called the church. Now, you, most of you, if you've been here any time at all, you know that every month we do a three-day fast. What, what you don't know always is the kind of things that are behind the scenes when, when we're fasting. But trust me, there's always a list of things. And uh, so in that particular Hungry for God fast, I sent out a letter to the, the church family, and I said, as we fast and pray these next three days, whatever else you pray for, I want you to pray against the spirit of death And pray that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will overcome the spirit of death in our region. And so we went into three days fasting and prayer. The night of the second day, uh, everybody was coming into the church uh, for the prayer time. So there was a line of cars that were all turning in, filled with people who loved Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, who had been fasting and praying for Uh, two days at that point. And right there at that intersection, a truck just swerved over and ran into uh, a little gal in a car and uh, uh, the the gal was laying out on the asphalt, bleeding out. Lou, because of being the trauma intervention counselor, he was able to go past the tape and everything. He just walked up and said, what's going on? Uh, they said, well, it's a head-on accident. The driver of the truck is over there crying. Uh, she's not going to make it. Uh, the ambulance is on the way. Lou recognized the guy from having gone to school with him, went over and said, what happened? He said, I don't know what happened. He said, I was driving, and I, I saw her coming, and, and I blacked out, and, and when I came to, she was laying on the asphalt dying. Now, that's, that's how spirits take advantage of people who are not protected Uh, by the name of the Lord Jesus and the indwelling uh, uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, we knew that was an in-your-face. We're going to have somebody die right at the mouth of your driveway. And so Lou uh, went from car to car. Every one of them were GTers coming to the Hungry for God fast, fasting and praying for the spirit of life to triumph over the spirit of death. And he went from car to car, He said, this is the young lady's name, uh, and they say she's not going to make it. We need to pray for a miracle. This is a showdown between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. He went down uh, the list of cars. Everybody prayed. God intervened. Uh, She uh, recovered. It wasn't an instantaneous thing. They took her to the hospital, but but she, she didn't die. They were sure that she would. She recovered completely. And Lou was able to minister to the guy who had um, uh, been involved in the truck. And so uh, it, was, it was a great um, breakthrough. We're talking about breakthroughs. The prophetic word that came Thursday is it's time for a breakthrough. Let me tell you how breakthroughs were. Uh, th- there was that intense confrontation. And then the next day, nobody in Yuba or Sutter County died. The next day, nobody in Yuba Sutter County died. It went on so long that they they had a a front page of the Peel Democrat. It says Yuba City or Garden of Eden. And it said, as long as there has been a a historic account of deaths in this area, there has never been such a long time where nobody died. No SIDS death, no accidents, no overdoses, no, no murder, no mayhem. Nobody died for any reason for a very long time. Now, eventually, uh, it, it went back to um, it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And and uh, uh, we know that that uh, that death is just uh, a part of the fallen human life. Remember, we were created to never die, but death is the result of the curse of sin on the planet. And, and it went back to what would be considered an, a normal attrition rate in the counties. But uh, that was just a, a glaring instance of God uh, smacking down the enemy 
and the people of God winning a great victory. Now, um, <clears throat> some of you, this may stretch you a little bit, but if you're going to get, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to be spiritual. Just saying. Okay? So, uh, we had a worship leader who was a seer. And she didn't see all the time. Cheryl and I know people who see all the time. They just look around. They see the angels and the demons and whatever's going on. Uh, we know other people that on occasion, in fact, we know a lot of other people on, on occasion. And it's happened to both Cheryl and I a number of times where God grants you the ability to see in the spirit realm. Now, we had a worship leader uh, and, and she heard this story and she wanted to go up into the buttes to a place called Happy Valley. How many have heard of Happy Valley? Okay. Some of you heard of Happy Valley. It's a sacred Maidu Indian um, grounds, and you can't go up there unless you have a special hall pass from the historic society or from the Indians themselves. So anyway, uh, she asked, how did you go up there? And I said, well, we actually... we." We got a special hall pass from from above. We just uh, went and did it. Uh, she said, well, I, I want to go so bad. I feel like I need to pray up there, blah, blah, blah. Well, she saw in the newspaper, she saw an invitation for anyone who wanted to go to Happy Valley that would be willing to walk a llama into Happy Valley. It's quite a hike. It's like a four-hour hike. But this was a llama trainer, and she wanted to train some young llamas uh, to, you know, carry packs. And so if you were willing to lead a llama, you could go with her, and she put everybody's lunch in, in the llama, you know, the saddlebags, and, and away they went on the llama trek. And so uh, she signed up for it because she'd always wanted to go into Happy Valley and she liked hiking anyway. So they're hiking into Happy Valley and if you fly over the buttes uh, in an airplane, it, there's this beautiful little round valley and the buttes just came up all around it and it's really quite spectacular. Uh, and so she's just breaking over into Happy Valley and suddenly, all the llamas go nutso, berserk out of their minds. Just suddenly, there's a llama panic attack. <laughs> and so the, the llama trainer is saying, hold on to your llamas, hold on to your llamas. Everybody grab their, uh, their, uh, their bridle, uh, their um, halter, excuse me. Their halter, grab their halter and hold on to them. Don't let them get away. Now... Our worship leader, she looks up like, what are you, what, what's everybody afraid of? She looks up there. Guess what she sees? Drum roll, please. Thank you. She sees a huge black and red dragon that is curled up all the way around the perimeter of that valley. And it's in chains. And there are huge angels that are holding it in chains. And all the llamas, and by the way, animals are much more sensitive to spiritual reality than most humans. That's why dogs will growl at a, just a blank spot in your house because they see a spirit that you don't see. And that happens a lot. But anyway, uh, all kinds of animals are, are sensitive that way. But these llamas saw that dragon. How many saw Jurassic Park when they tied a goat out there to, to try to get the T-Rex to come out and eat it, right? Well, I don't know if they'd seen the movie or not, but uh, those llamas were like, we ain't getting anywhere near that dragon. And, uh, and so, um, so sh she just began to talk to her llama, and she said, hey, you don't need to be afraid. You're with me. I have power over the dragon. If you stay with me, the dragon can't hurt you. And suddenly her llama just chilled out, just like, oh, okay. So, 
So she went out to the llama trainer who couldn't get her llama to calm down. And she said, hey, my llama is fine. Would you like me to lead the way? Because maybe the other llamas will act in kind if they see that we're okay. She said, yeah, try that. So um, so she, she went to the front of the line and all the llamas calmed down and they, they walked down into the valley uh, with her at the front of the line. And when they got there to have lunch, the llama trainer came up and said, uh, what, how, how come you know so much about llamas? She said, eh, never worked with a llama before today. She said, what? She said, you're a llama whisperer. <laughs> she said, well, I did whisper to my llama, I will admit that. But anyway, uh, the lady said, would you come to work for me? And, um, and she passed on that. But uh, now, uh, again, I've been able to travel to the continents of the world, and um, most of the world would believe that in a heartbeat. In the West, people are filled with doubt and unbelief, which is why the West is notorious for the lack of supernatural miracles like healing and other, other things. And you see if they're commonplace in Mexico, they're commonplace in places like Vanuatu and the Samoan Islands and the, the uh, Visayas. And, and they're commonplace in most of the world, all of South America. They're commonplace in the entire continent of Africa. They're commonplace in the entire continent of India because people understand the pervasive reality of the spirit realm. In the West, because of rationalism, which is uh, an offense to God. Rationalism says, if, if I can't understand it, I don't have to believe it. I can just toss it. So I don't understand uh, how angels would chain a dragon into submission and have to go, I don't understand that, so I'm going to throw out the story. Proving, of course, that you're less spiritual than a llama. <laughs> just saying. But anyway, <laughs> um, now, now all that is part and parcel of this, this uh, reality that God called us here to be a part of something sensational that, w that was his eternal plan for this region. It, it's not my plan, not Cheryl's plan, not Jess's plan. It, it's not Paul Daniel's plan. It's God's plan. And we have been honored to be a part of it, right? And so, again, uh, any one of us, we have the right to forfeit God's plan. I don't want to. We also have a right to reduce it to 70% of what God envisioned or 50% or 30% or 10%. I, I don't want any of that mess. I want to yield myself as fully as I know how to so that God can fulfill 100% of what he has envisioned to happen in this region. And he has uh, been very, very gracious and faithful to communicate to that to us over and over and over and over again. And so the, the beauty of what happened on Thursday night is uh, a man came from southern India, not knowing anything that I've told you about, and said, um, it, it's time for, there's been a seed time, it's time for the harvest. The harvest is going to feature a breakthrough of the glory of God that is, is so powerful and, and so uh, fast and aggressive that it will be a, Master of breakthrough moments. Behold, the Lord has broken out against our enemies like great waters bursting from a dam. I think that's pretty awesome. So, I just wanted to share that with you. 
I love it too. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I want to. I want us to pray into that. I. I also want to. Um, uh, maybe I'll do it before, and then we'll just pray into the whole, whole lot of it. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you that are asking, what has come of the rescue of the children, and where to from here on that? I want to address that just very quickly. Now, um, if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, going back a little over two weeks ago, uh, I was having a breakfast appointment with the vice admiral in, in the Navy SEALs. And he's active duty vice admiral. And um, he meets with me from time to time to just unburden his soul and talk about uh, some of the things he's going through and, and ask me to pray with him, which I do. He was talking about uh, the uh, the international corruption that they're facing that uh, that circumvents the true rescue of children from sex slavery. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. He says we have. How many have heard of uh, DUMS, deep underground military bases, and, and them being uh, converted to um, uh, thoroughfares for child trafficking and tunnels and all kinds of stuff? There's a lot of weird stuff going on today. But anyway, uh, this vice admiral, he, he said, uh, I need you to pray for me again to not lose heart. Uh, and for my team not to lose heart, because we risk our lives to rescue children from the most evil, vile people on the planet. And those children are rescued for a short time, and then the authorities take custody of them. And when they do, those children go right back into sex trafficking because the authorities are involved in the market. Now, we, we were part of helping... Um, Sound of Freedom uh, be a blockbuster. We, we uh, bought a lot of tickets, filled up the theater several times. A lot of people did as well. And that is a phenomenon. And Disney is scrambling and, and trying to make up uh, excuses. Have you noticed that people making excuses invariably look stupid? Uh, but anyway, that's been going on. And, um, and, uh, but just, Prior to that happening, uh, with the Sound of Freedom, I met with this vice admiral, and as we were talking, uh, and, and he was saying, uh, pray, pray for our teams, that they get, they get really tired of this revolving door where they risk their lives, and then the kids don't really get saved because they have to turn them over to the United Nations, and they go right back into sex trafficking. Now, Sound of Freedom rightly stated uh, uh, that the that child uh, trafficking uh, is a one hundred and fifty billion dollar a year international business, a and the the hub is the United States of America. And if you know anybody that doesn't think that the United States of America is under the judgment of God, you might just remind them that Jesus said it would be better if you weren't born or that a millstone was hung around your neck and you were thrown into the deepest sea than, than, than that you harm one of these little ones. That's the heart of Christ. So anyway, uh, right in the big middle of this, he's just unburdening his soul and talking about um, something that had happened in another country. And God quickened to me a memory that was 20 years old. 20 years ago, we had opened our home to a young man that was coming out of prison. Um, he um, is way too young to be in prison, but he, he was just coming out. He didn't have anywhere to go. He had a terrible family. And so we brought him into our home, and we were loving him. God spoke to Cheryl to, to pour life into him and and 
She wouldn't be disappointed. Now, we've, we've done that a number of times, as you all know. But in this case, uh, though we loved the boy and really uh, poured our love into him, let him stay with us quite a long time, he eventually left. He went back into um, a very wild life, uh, went back into um, being a drug dealer, and uh, went back to prison. So, um, so I just want to tell you, if you're going to be effective in the kingdom of God, you need to remember nothing ever done for the Lord is in vain. That's a promise of Scripture. We, we don't know all the ramifications of the seeds that are planted in people's hearts, but, but if we even give a cup of water to somebody in the name of Christ, it's not in vain. And so, well, we loved him, so our hearts into him. He went back to prison. It seemed like um, the whole thing was a wash. And now I'm sitting with this uh, high military officer. He's telling me uh, uh, how uh, disappointing it is to be involved in this revolving door. And I just remember clear as a bell ministering to this young boy who was filled with hatred and loathing and, and honestly a, a desire to murder people for what they had done to him. And, and um, though I'm not advocating murder, if you heard what happened to that little boy, you would understand that feeling. That is, that is inevitable unless you have a major dose of the redeeming love of God. They had violated that little boy. They, they had uh, taken advantage of him. Uh, it was his own uncles, and he said, uh, I was trying to, Cheryl and I were trying to get him to embrace forgiveness and he said I'm not going to forgive them I'll kill every one of them uh, this is what they did to me they took me down to a barge between San Francisco and Oakland he said it looks like an industrial barge it's just a floating whorehouse for kids and they took me down there and terrible things happened to me and no I won't forgive them if I get a chance I'll kill every one of them so anyway uh, that's you know that's you get into those kind of things when you're pastoring broken people. And um, that was 20 years ago. I'd forgotten about it because so much stuff happens. That's just the day in the life of a pastor, especially one here at Glad Tidings. And so um, I hadn't thought about that for a long, long time. Now I'm sitting there. And Holy Spirit, remember one of the promises is the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind the things that you need to, uh, to focus on. Suddenly, just clears a bell. So I said to this guy, I said, have you ever busted any floating barges out between San Francisco and Oakland that are part of the child sex trafficking? He said, no. He said, why would you ask me that? I told him this story. He said, well, both Oakland and San Francisco are filled with child sex trafficking, but we haven't heard of any barges. He said, do you think that boy's telling the truth? And I said, I will guarantee you that boy is telling the truth. 21-year-old boys don't talk about stuff like that just to try to impress you. I guarantee you he was telling the truth. He said, huh. And then we went on to something else. We started talking about the border crisis, and, and uh, I came back to the office. And the next day, he called multiple times, I, I was able to take the fourth call. I said, what's up? He said, I just wanted to thank you for the tip. I said, what, what tip? He said, yesterday, the tip about the barge. I said, oh, are, are you guys going to check that out? He said, already did. He said, the minute you left the restaurant, I called uh, Coronado Island, scrambled the team, said, get, get up to San Francisco and Oakland, both sides of the river. Uh, turn over every stone, try to find out if there's a barge out there somewhere. And he said, this morning, we raided it at first light, and we rescued 807 children that were being held in sex slavery. <laughs> now, hallelujah to that. Then, uh, then two days later, and this one m made the news, the, the first one, I think it was on Israeli News Live, but by and large, it, it didn't make uh, uh, the news. But two days later, they uh, apprehended another barge just coming in to San Francisco Bay. Uh, based on the information they got on the first barge, 
um, they uh, checked the, the, the itinerary of um, a, a number of vessels that they thought might have potential, but one of them had stopped at six internationally known sex trafficking ports on the way to San Francisco. And they thought, you know, that's probably not a coincidence. They busted it coming in, rescued a whole bunch more kids. And so together, uh, I don't have an exact number, but it's around 2,000 kids that were rescued in, in just a, a 48 hour period. Now, since then, um, the man that I was talking to said, you know, I, I came to tell you to pray for us because of the disappointment of rescuing children and turning them right back over to the people who are involved in profiting from their sex trafficking. And he says, these kids are going to go back to California Child Protective Services and any kids they can't handle go back to the UN and they will go right back into sex trafficking. And he said, will you, will you uh, take responsibility to try to get the attention of the people of the United States and any pastors who will help? We have to come up with our own solution because the United States government is the biggest perpetrator of child slavery in the world. We cannot get any help from the government. We have to do it some other way. Well, um, if you're part of this church, you know that right now we need about $20 million for the projects we already have going. And and now there's this. And I, I told this guy, I said, listen, our ministry motto for 37 years is find a need and meet it, find a hurt and heal it. There is a, a horrific need and there is horrific hurt. And so I will tell you right now, I will do everything in my power to find a solution. But that probably not going to happen in the next 15 minutes. I said, this is a huge, huge project, but I'll go to work on it. So uh, some of you have been asking the last uh, week and a half, uh, has anything come of the Leo Chesney Center? If you don't know about that, as soon as I hung up the phone, we began to pray. Uh, the church had already inquired into a, um, a, a facility about five miles north of here that was built as a women's prison. The, the uh, evil, uh, greedy uh, state of California immediately began to pass legislation to make it illegal for anyone to compete with them in the private sector. And so this multi-million dollar facility was put out of business by the state. That should get your dander up right there. That, that was an evil thing to do. But anyway, we went to them. It's been setting empty for 14 years. We went to them some time ago because we were wanting to expand our, um, our recovery ministries, especially to make room for women and children. And... I thank God for Feather River Men's Center and for the Faith Project, but, but we thought we need to have uh, a place where we can help women and children. And so we went out and we asked the Leo Chesney uh, Center, the, the um, consortium that holds that, we said, would you consider giving us this and we will use it for a good cause because that's what you wanted it used for is a good cause. So they said, no, uh, we're going to just uh, keep it on ice and wait for California to allow us to help in the, the prison system. Well, that, th that's not going to happen uh, anytime soon. But anyway, that was their decision. They, they pitched us a deal to buy it for uh, $6.4 something like that. Uh, so I, we went back to them and said, hey, uh, we're, we're knocking on your door again. Uh, we both know that California is not going to suddenly find a soft spot in its heart for charities. Uh, and so uh, we're giving you a chance to 
to recover your investment by using it in a really good cause. And they're thinking about that. Their knee-jerk reaction is we have to get $6.5 million for it. Uh, that's a problem uh, when you already need $20 million. Uh, and, of course, after we, after we bought that for $6.5 million, we would still have to uh, turn it into a lovely place uh, for children so they didn't feel like they were going from one form of uh, slavery to, to another. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to say this. We're working on it. Uh, while we're working on it, of course, the, uh, the feces hit the oscillator on this whole film uh, with uh, Cry of Freedom. And so now, uh, if, you've, if you've heard Caviezel uh, speaking lately, uh, or any of the guys involved in that, Tim Ballard just spoke yesterday, and, and he, he said, wow, I, I thought it was intense uh, before the, the film came out. I thought the film would probably uh, rally everybody to support our cause, but he said the intensity of opposition is unbelievable. So now, uh, in that setting, uh, we have been advised not to launch a coast-to-coast, -coast, border border-to-border campaign until we can sort out all the players so that we don't get part way uh, down the road and find out that, that somebody's a weak link that discredits the whole movement. We're working on that, and we're, we're, uh, we're working with some of the best people in the world to do that, and just uh, got a message from one of them uh, this morning before the service. So I just want you to know we're working on it. In the meanwhile, we have added, because people are asking about it, we have added to uh, our giving site at uh, churchgladtidings.com. If you go to giving, there's a drop-down menu that has different ministries. Uh, and we've added a ministry called Peace of Heaven uh, Kids Refuge. That's Peace of Heaven Kids Refuge. That's where we're beginning to uh, collect money uh, to, to try to pull this off. Now, uh, we really need the intervention of God. It, it, it has to be um, something that is God-sized. But how many believe that if God be your partner, you should make your plans big? Okay. Uh, so here at Glad Tidings, we've, we're, in, we're really in a good spot on that making your plans big uh, deal. But anyway... Um, I wanted you to know about it. I want to pray into it. We are getting people that are contacting us that are very interested in helping. Uh, well, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate every dime. We, everything we've done around here, we, we did with people giving a couple hundred bucks when they could. And, uh, but in something this size, we need some major donors, and we need them uh, right away. So uh, I want to ask you to stand up. We're going to close in prayer. Uh, and we're going to pray into all of this stuff. Now, remember, the, the message, oh, we're, not, we're going to pray, and then you're going to sit down again. But anyway, uh, I forgot we didn't do the announcements, and we need to do that. But, but um, the, um, th this is really, really important, okay? The, the prophetic message that God, again, brought to us, confirmed by this brother from India, is that, uh, God is honoring the seed time. We've planted seeds, we've watered them, we've cultivated them. Now, now it's time for a harvest. The harvest is going to come like a flood, like a buffalo stampede, Lori. That's another one of her prophetic dreams, a buffalo stampede that turned into a harvest. Uh, that's how it's going to come. Uh, you can only get so ready for that, but we've been working on it. The main thing is that we posture our hearts with anticipation and, and we commit to God and to one another and to ourselves that we will do everything in our power to cooperate with what God is doing. And that's where we are today. Um, and so let's, let's pray into that and ask God uh, to, uh, you know, we're not asking God to partner with us we're just submitting to him the fact that we are very, very willing to partner with him. And that's, that's different. But we do know how God feels about uh, the little ones and about this uh, heinous evil that has 
really um, uh, just polluted our country and the world. We know how God feels about that. So uh, let's just submit ourselves to him. Lord, uh, we will partner with you. We will do everything that we can. And we trust you. Listen to this now. We trust God that when we have done everything we can, he will do everything we can. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, here we are, Lord. We are your people. We love you. Um, we know that we're just, uh, we're made of clay, but within us resides the presence of your eternal, glorious spirit. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the high honor it is to partner with you in the establishment of the eternal kingdom of God in the earth. We thank you for that, Lord. What a, what a high honor. And Lord, uh, as we have done in, in an incomplete and fumbling way sometimes, but we have tried to partner with you. We have tried to yield ourselves to what you uh, wanted to do in our midst. And Lord, you know that's our heart. We yield to you. Lord, if we can do anything, we want to learn to allow the flow of your Holy Spirit uh, that will uh, release life and light and love and liberty into the hearts and souls of uh, hundreds of thousands. Lord, we believe in the greatness of this vision. It wasn't our idea. Uh, your word tells us not to despise prophecy, uh, but to test everything and hold fast to that which is good. Lord, we believe this is a good word, that you put gold in the earth to represent what you wanted to do at the end of the age, to manifest your glory in the earth. And we say yes to that. Uh, we uh, just yield ourselves to that in every way we know how. We do ask you to open up the windows of heaven and provide. We do ask you to give us wisdom on how to partner uh, with you well and all the details that that involves. We ask especially for your provision for these children, Lord, that we can destroy the work of the devil that is exploiting them. Lord, we pray that you would bring uh, to justice these evil, evil people uh, that, uh, that, that are really empowered and taken over by the spirit of the whore of Babylon that your word talks about, that uh, thinks that she's untouchable and, uh, and she traffics in human souls. But Lord, your word says that she will be destroyed in a moment and the kings of the earth will mourn. And we pray for that to happen, Lord. In, in our lifetime, let us partner with you in a, a destruction of this, uh, this a whorish system that is so evil and so corrupt uh, and so pompous and smug in its corruption. Lord, we just say, uh, use us in whatever way pleases you and give us grace to partner well with you in, in these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.